Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caleb Schiavone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Modern Trust Laws Delivering Direction and Control. As always, our goal is to provide you with engaging and informative content from some of the best professionals in the region. Today's webinar is brought to you by Bridgeford Trust Company. We have David Warren here, Chairman of the Board and Co-Founder of Bridgeford Trust Company and President and CEO of Bridgeford Advisors. Before David begins, I want to remind you that if anyone has any questions for our speakers, we encourage you to submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel. We will do our best to answer them either during the presentation or at the end of the webinar. Well, that's enough for me. Thanks again for spending some time with us today. And with that, I will turn things over to David. Thank you very much. It is great to uh, to be here with everybody today. Uh, it's great to see so many friends on the uh, webinar uh, from not only around the United States but across the world, and actually some new friends that I met last week uh, in uh, in Mexico City at the Step event that we sponsored. Uh, and I'm I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Uh, generally, modern trust laws is is an area that I am particularly passionate about. That we're particularly passionate about at Bridgeford Trust Company and. It really has fueled so much of what we're able to do for domestic families uh, and international families in terms of highly sophisticated trust planning around um, asset protection and, and privacy and um, really sophisticated state tax planning. So really the purpose today is to talk about what has changed in the trust world, which is pretty amazing actually when you think about what we can do today that we couldn't do when I was in law school back in the 90s even, which wasn't, isn't even that long ago. And, and what really has happened is it, it's changed the landscape in such a, a dynamic way that now we're able to deliver um, so much more direction and control uh, to settlers of trusts, uh, beneficiaries of trusts, and their advisors than, than ever before because of, of these modern trust laws. And so for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes, we're going to go through some of the most um, prevalent ones that have changed, uh, again, what I believe to be the entire landscape of, of trust planning uh, in the United States and for international families coming to the United States. This quote is particularly um, applicable uh, that I read about 2012 when we launched Bridgeford, uh, which was in Trust and States magazine that says, legal expert, experts contend that there have been more changes in trust law in the last 20 years than have taken place in the prior two centuries. These changes promise to affect every aspect of how trusts are administered for years to come. You know, even back in 2012, I don't think we all realized just how true that statement um, is and has become. Um, there is no question that the changes that have happened in the last 20 years have radically changed um, fundamental notions of how trusts are administered, have challenged fundamental definitions of even what is a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust, uh, and how these trusts can be changed uh, and, and modified. So that trust, uh, or rather that quote, is, in many respects has become a guiding principle for Bridgeford, and we're excited to uh, talk about these modern trust laws. And before we get into the new, we need to kind of juxtapose it, I think, a little bit with the old. Um, you know, what's, what has changed so radically when I practiced law and when I was with a large bank-based trust companies uh, in the United States, in some cases some of the largest in the United States, one in particular, what has been it was fascinating to watch is the evolution. And so when I talk about old, the old paradigm is, you know, a legal, a legal end to a trust, end date to a trust. And I'm referring to the rule against perpetuity. I'm referring to an old arcane law that said the trust had to end at a certain time, which was measured by uh, a myriad of different factors. But, but the point was the old paradigm was trust had to end. And you juxtapose that and compare that to what is now the case, which is trusts. Uh, can live forever, and we're going to talk about how that works and, and what that means. Um, perhaps, though, what I think is even more revolutionary in many respects is how um, the paradigm has changed relative to um, bundled versus unbundled approach to trust services. And what I mean by that is the traditional model, which we're all familiar with, and which frankly I think is broken um, and has proven to be broken, is the bundled approach that you see at large bank-based trust companies uh, like a bank in New York Mellon or, or a PNC, where the asset management uh, and trust administration is bundled together and handled uh, all under one roof, uh, which is an interesting uh, dynamic that has developed over the last, I would say, 100 years or so, where banks manage money and they do so in conjunction with trust administration, 
which which has always been a challenge for me even when I practiced law because I didn't understand how two um, very different disciplines can be bundled together uh, into one uh, offering when when it required very different very different um, talents and and skill sets. The new paradigm unbundles that uh, it, it changes the the whole um, structure, um, creating two independent entities that uh, one entity managing the dollars and one entity um, actually performing the trust work. And we think that that is powerful. We think that is in many respects liberating, particularly for large families who want to have control over how these assets are managed and who particularly manages the assets. Uh, and, and, and that has is, is been a complete game changer, which is probably an overused statement these days, but it is actually a game changer. And that's uh, differentiated from delegated and from directed. And what I mean by that is that the traditional model, when it was bundled, delegated investment management uh, to an in-house investment manager, all working for the same company. And, and the new model, the new paradigm is directed, and we're going to talk about directed trusts and, and how they work and how they've changed the industry. But this delegated model became very problematic. I think it was always problematic, uh, but for, particularly for large families um, that would worry about the conflict of interest. And if you stop and think about it for, for a minute, you really have to wonder about the obvious conflict of interest that, it, that exists. With any bank, big bank or any large asset manager that is also serving as trustee, they're, they're, the conflict of interest is inherent, particularly if that particular asset manager that also works for the same uh, company that the trustee works for um, isn't performing well. And, and that in and of itself, I think, provides, and not only I think, it's been written about for, for many years, represents and presents an unavoidable and unreconcilable, frankly, conflict of interest that is addressed in and, and resolved really through the directed trust concept where there is no conflict. Um, they're independent advisors. The trust companies are an independent entity not working for one another and not even beholden to one another. Uh, and that lack of conflict uh, with respect to the asset management piece and the trust uh, administration has changed the trust world very dramatically and has opened up a whole new world of control and direction. And it's something that we're particularly excited about. You know, the old paradigm focused on asset management only. If, if you go to a big, large bank, and I'm not picking on anyone in particular, but um, there are many, uh, they are really asset managers. If, if we're being honest, they're asset managers, and they want to manage money. And that's great. I mean, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, business model, and it's very profitable. But the problem is um, trusts weren't created uh, at, at way back. Uh, I guess the first set of trusts maybe came out of Massachusetts in the United States. Uh, to, for, for people to manage money. It wasn't the concept of a trust was to move property uh, tax efficiently from one jurist, uh, from one, excuse me, from one generation to another. Um, not necessarily though just investable assets. So what we're seeing in the marketplace with this traditional bundled delegated approach that has, which is full of conflict of interest, um, the idea that they only also want to manage money. So asset classes like real estates or closely held stock or artwork or, which is pretty exciting right now, cryptocurrency. Uh, all these unusual, which has been considered non-traditional assets, uh, large bank-based trust companies don't want to deal with. Because why? Because they haven't figured out a way to, to bill it or feed in a way that makes it profitable. And I, I, don't, I don't mean that to be sarcastic, but the reality is it's a business model that, 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 that a lot of the large uh, trust companies have chosen not to follow. The new paradigm presents uh, an unbundled approach that allows for the the um, non-traditional assets uh, to be held in, in a trust structure. The directed trust is built around that idea of giving the freedom and flexibility to the trustee to have the comfort level to hold cryptocurrency, um, to hold um, real estate and closely held stock. Um, assets that traditional big bank-based trust companies do not want to hold. You know, when we were getting ready to launch Bridgeford Trust Company, um, we spent a lot of time interviewing attorneys uh, and accountants and asset managers from really up and down the East Coast uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region in New York City. And, and we kept hearing the, the, the complaint, the common complaint that we would hear about the traditional, I'll call, I am calling the old paradigm, is that the model was too rigid. It was too inflexible, it was too expensive, there was poor service, high turnover. And all of those factors, and, and I experienced it firsthand when I practiced law, all those factors resulted in attorneys around the country seeking 
a trust solution through a family member or a close friend, appointing an individual trustee because, frankly, they just lost faith in the traditional corporate trustee model, which is unfortunate on so many different levels, particularly since the corporate trustee model, when it's working correctly, is unequivocally the best model because corporate trustees don't die and corporate trustees know how to handle the nuances of trust administration and corporate trustees understand their reporting requirements. So we can argue over whether or not a corporate trustee is better than an individual trustee, but I would argue that that's not really the argument. The problem is the individual trustee has become in vogue because corporate trustees have failed and they have failed for the those three reasons there. They've been too rigid, inflexible, expensive, Poor service and high turnover has just become unacceptable. But along comes the new paradigm because of these modern trust laws that we're going to talk about. And that gives uh, more direction and control to the families and, and to the beneficiaries and the settlers of the trusts. And you'll see why in a minute. Um, much more cost efficient because of the um, bifurcation of liability. And we'll talk about that. And the boutique approach to service. Um, companies like Bridgeford around the, around the country who are partnering with asset managers, uh, actually partnering even, even with banks and, and attorneys and, and accountants and other advisors, um, they, they tend to go to the marketplace. I know Bridgeford does with a more a boutique approach where we answer the phone and it's not an 800 number and, and we are nimble and quick to make decisions and quick to understand why the trust is written the way that it is and not at all cookie cutter. And I think all of these aspects that we've talked about, again, juxtaposing the old and the new, are exciting. The new paradigm is very exciting. It's something that I'm extraordinarily passionate about. It's something um, that I think has changed the trust industry in a very positive way. And it's how Bridgeford Trust Company, frankly, has been built. It was all around the new and modern trust laws. Which brings us to another quote, uh, actually from the same source. Surveys of affluent families across the country consistently indicated that this demographic has grown weary of the inflexibility, turnover, and exorbitant fees associated with institutional bank-based trust departments. So we've identified a problem. Uh, the, the old versus new paradigm is, exists and is a, is, a, is a reality that has to be dealt with by modern trust laws. And here's where it gets exciting. Modern trust laws like the Dynasty Trust, Directed Trusts, Trust Protector, Family Advisor, Decanting, Special Purpose Trust, and Special Purpose Entity and Privacy, all things we're going to talk about throughout the rest of our time together. What you're looking at here on this screen is the foundation of modern trust laws in the United States. And while the word revolutionary sounds somewhat dramatic, it actually is revolutionary. And the, the, the planning opportunities available now today to advisors because a company is frankly like Bridgeford Trust Company embracing new laws and embracing the new paradigm is really phenomenal and is, is a, again a game changer in the trust industry. The Dynasty Trust. A lot of you on this call on this webinar I am sure are well familiar with the Dynasty Trust. I thought we'd talk about it briefly because in my opinion and the opinion of people far smarter than myself this was the beginning of modern trust law. South Dakota was the first to abolish the rule against perpetuities in 1983. And I believe that in, since 1983 on, that was the beginning of what we're calling modern trust laws. This was the first move to address the old paradigm and to fix it. And this was a direct market response to very wealthy families in this country who didn't understand why an arbitrary rule would exist in the United States to say that their trust had to terminate at some point in the future, thereby paying estate tax uh, to the United States government. South Dakota being as independent as they are, and they still are very independent, again, were the, was the first to acknowledge this problem and solve it. And again, I say is the beginning of modern trust law. Um, not to belabor dynasty trust, because I'm sure many people on this call are familiar, but essentially it allows the trust to live forever uh, because the rule against perpetuities uh, was abolished. Um, it avoids federal taxation on trust assets forever, which is a very, very compelling planning tool, which now is, is I think, commonly used um, and commonly, commonly um, employed. Most, I should not say most states. Many states, not majority of states, but many states in the United States have either abolished the rule against perpetuities or has uh, uh, curtailed it, or I should say expanded it, rather, to make it, uh, make the trust or allow the trust to live a lot longer. It's very important, though, to understand 
that these states that have abolished or otherwise modified the rule against perpetuities are not all created equally. And we're going to get to that at the very end where we do a very objective comparison of what we call dynasty trust states and a very objective comparison of states that have embraced modern trust law um, to talk about really just because the state has a modern trust law or has a dynasty trust capability doesn't mean that that's the end of the inquiry. We still need to decide which state is the best to be in. Uh, we also have to be aware when looking at these dynasty trusts some state constitutional issues. Uh, some states, like Nevada, um, I don't think they've corrected this, this inconsistency, but the state constitution uh, has a provision that allows, or I should say that forbids, the, the curtailing or changing of the rule against perpetuities. Uh, Nevada and other states changed their rule against perpetuities, and some argue that that's in violation of their own state constitution. And some further argue that those dynasty trusts that have been created may not even be enforceable um, if Nevada doesn't get around to changing their constitution. And then Nevada is just one of uh, several states that have that issue. I should note, South Dakota does not have that issue. South, South Dakota's um, abolition of the rule against perpetuities back in 1983 was not at all a violation of the constitution because there was not a provision there forbidding it. This is now the transition into, in my view, probably the most exciting aspects of what we're going to talk about today. And this quote, again, really does a nice job of, of encapsulating where we're going. The emergence of upstart non-depository public direct, directed trust companies is a disruptive force to be reckoned with, in, and I would add, in the United States. We're going to transition into modern trust laws. We're going to talk about and define what a directed trust is, but there is no question that Upstart, non-depository public trust companies like Bridgeford Trust Company have absolutely disrupted the trust industry. Has um, they, in many respects, they they are the rebels in the trust industry, directly addressing the negativity that I that we outlined earlier under the old paradigm. And I, when this was written in 2012, it was true. In 2018, it's of course it's even more true. We see trust companies like Bridgeford across the country and even now around the world that are becoming um, the solution for very wealthy families. Um, large families are leaving uh, large bank-based trust companies uh, and going into multifamily offices that bifurcate um, asset management and trust administrative functions. And so this is an absolute disruptive force. And, and frankly, you know, Bridgeford's proud to be part of this new paradigm and this new, new approach to the market. The directed trust <clears throat> is absolutely the foundation of what is and has evolved into the ability uh, to deliver so much more direction and control to, um, to the settlers of trusts and, and beneficiaries and the advisors that we serve. And, and the legal framework is simple. It legally bifurcates the liability, which is to say that liability relative to asset management stays with the asset manager. Liability with respect to trust administration and distributions and reporting and tax reporting stays with the trust company. So the, you might be asking yourself, well, why does that matter? Who cares? Well, it creates the legal framework that allows for the, the, the independent trust company to feel comfortable interacting on an independent basis with asset managers or banks around the country. It creates the legal framework and the protection that an asset company, a trust company like Bridgeford Trust Company is not going to be worried uh, so much about um, the, the conflict of interest because there is no conflict of interest because it's been bifurcated, the liability, and, and the roles are clearly defined. And that, again, has set the stage legally for what has developed into uh, a whole directed trust industry and trust companies that primarily deal with directed trust. Um, it provides maximum flexibility and control relative to trust alloc um, asset allocation, diversification, investment management, and distributions, and we'll see why. Essentially, the directed trust can um, hold assets of any type as directed by the settler and or the investment committee, and we'll get into that in more, more details. And as I mentioned, it unbundles traditional functions. It, 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 juxt it juxtaposes asset management from trust services uh, in a way uh, that makes the administration smoother and without conflict of interest. This chart is, is probably the most, the clearest way to, to discuss it and to talk about it in the context of how it provides so much more flexibility and control. 
if we take a traditional, well, not a traditional, if we take the directed trust structure, the John Doe Family Trust is established. It's established as a directed trust. Within the document itself, there is a distribution committee, an investment committee, and an administrative trustee. The administrative trustee is Bridgeford Trust Company or, or companies like Bridgeford who are willing to work in the directed trust space. They're, they're responsible for traditional trustee activity, which is to say they own the assets, establish and maintain trust accounts, prepare and, tr and sign tr trust tax returns, trust statements, make distributions and receive contributions. And more importantly, and this is where the, where the magic happens, take direction from the investment committee and the distribution committee. So let's first focus on the investment committee. The investment committee, in my view, is the very engine and the, where, the, where the power resides in the directed trust structure. The investment committee is responsible for stocks and bonds, insurance, artwork, closely held stock, real estate. I, I we should add, I should add uh, cryptocurrency, any type of asset. The investment committee uh, has and can and does direct trust companies like Bridgeford to hold. And they're responsible, when I say they, the investment is responsible from a fiduciary perspective for the investment management of all types of assets. So if the investment committee tells Bridgeford Trust Company to own, Bridge, uh, own cryptocurrency, we own Brit the cryptocurrency. If the investment committee tells us to own uh, a billion dollars of, of Enron stock, we own it. Because the reliability and fiduciary responsibility around those decisions are with the investment committee. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The investment committee can be made can be made up of close family advisors, attorneys, accountants, and the settler of the trust. He or she can actually serve on the investment committee. So if we're following the logic and the structure, then it's very clear why this idea of direction and control is so compelling here in this conversation because if the settler, and I'm telling you, in fact, and under South Dakota law for sure, the settler can serve on the investment committee and actually be the only investment committee member, the settler then directs and can direct through the structure of the investment committee, Bridgeford Trust Company, to hold really any asset it, it want, he or she wants to hold in trust and direct the investment um, structure and more importantly, perhaps, invest who is going to be managing the assets. So if the investment committee made up of the settler, or only the settler or other members of, of the, the trust advisor uh, group that they're surrounded by, wants Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley to manage the investments, they make a direction to Bridgeford and Bridgeford hires that, that asset manager. If, if they want to hold, again, cryptocurrency, they make a direction to Bridgeford and Bridgeford Trust Company works out the logistics of, of holding cryptocurrency. When I talk about the magic of the direction, tr directed trust being sort of concentrated in the investment committee, this is where the direction and control uh, resides, and this is where the entire industry has changed relative to the ability to avoid um, basically being told who your asset manager is going to be. You know, when you're dealing with very large families and very large families are dealing with very large bank-based trust companies, they want to be able to tell uh, the the invest or the trustee rather who's going to manage their money if you go to any one of the large big bank trust companies that I've talked about 98% of the time they're going to tell you who's managing the money this structure tur turns the tables and delivers so much more control back to the to the family and and their advisors than, than really ever before the distribution committee is is also very exciting because it, it does give more control over distribution decisions. Now, to be clear, the settler of the trust cannot be on the distribution committee, obviously for independent uh, reasons, um, but the distribution committee can be made up of, again, trusted advisors, attorneys, accountants, um, family members, and this distribution committee receives a request for distribution, a discretionary distribution, that is. And if, if the request for a distribution is for a $100,000 Lamborghini and, and the distribution committee believes that that's an appropriate distribution under the terms of the document, then they direct a company like Bridgeford serving in the administrative trustee capacity to make that distribution. Again, it opens up a whole new world 
and, and remove sort of that particular power from a rigid and often hard to deal with large uh, corporate trustee who frankly has probably a, a, a greater interest in denying the request because why would they want to make a distribution out of a trust that they're actually managing the money within because who wants to reduce their assets under management, right? And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but unfortunately I've had direct experiences in my lifetime where I've seen, I've seen decisions turn on that very point. So the distribution committee removes that conflict of interest and allows uh, the family to have much more input, we'll say, and control over distributions. Now, the distribution committee, while it's always available under the, under the directed trust structure, um, is not mandatory, which is to say the family or trustee committee can do it, or Bridgeford Trust Company can still act in that capacity as a traditional trust company and make uh, independent uh, trustee decisions through its investment, uh, um, excuse me, through its trust administrative committee, which a company like Bridgeford has. All trust companies, I would imagine, have that. So the distribution committee doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't, nobody has to be on it. It can just exist in the document, and then by default, that that responsibility falls to to Bridgeford or an administrative trustee. What I've described, again, is powerful. It is absolutely revolutionary, and I will tell everybody on this call, and I've said it for years, it has completely changed the dynamic of trust administration and how trusts are are, are dealt with in this country, and is one of the reasons why. Um, international families are coming to this country, um, well, they're coming for lots of reasons, but they're coming because they're realizing just how much control and direction they can have under this model. Now you see there the trust protector that is very much a part of this structure. It's not part of the directed trust law or statute. It's a whole separate law or statute, but the trust protector is often used in conjunction with um, the directed trust, and we'll explain that role in a minute, but that is another very exciting uh, and dynamic uh, development in trust law, which provides even more control and flexibility to uh, settlers of trust, uh, the family, and, and their advisors. So the trust protector, it's been referred to as a super trustee, and we love to work with them at Bridgeford Trust Company. We're certainly not afraid of them. And in many respects, um, especially under South Dakota law, you can have a lot more um, well, they can have more power than, than, than bridge for trust company or the administrative or corporate trustee. And, and again, I think we, we believe that's a very good thing. Um, and as I mentioned, it's used very much in conjunction with the directed trust and deli delivers even more control, even more control to settlers of, of trust beneficiaries and their advisors. The trust protector allows well, we'll talk about who the trust protector can be. A trust protector can be a lawyer, uh, an accountant. It's typically an accountant. Uh, it can be a, a close family member. Um, it could even be an entity, and we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a moment. But what that trust protector structure allows within the overall umbrella of a director trust is for advisors uh, and their family, or the, fam the families they serve, to control and implement many aspects, important aspects of control and direction with respect to investment management, uh, jurisdiction decisions, and trust distributions. And for example, um, I talked about the investment committee that has infinite power over all investment decisions, including who's going to manage the money. That power can also be exercised by a trustee. Um, a lot of people don't catch the nuance there. That's very important. So you can do and, and, and ascribe that exact same power to, um, to the trust protector. Um, the trustee uh, can be directed by the trust protector to change jurisdiction. So a trust protector, uh, perhaps it's a trust protector in a trust that is, is governed by Delaware law can simply with a stroke of a pen move that trust to a jurisdiction like South Dakota very simply and very easily. The uh, trust protector also can have distribution powers. So I talked earlier about the distribution committee. The trust protector also, again, can make distribution decisions. Um, those three areas are very powerful and, and a big reason why um, uh, people want, uh, settlers of trust want trust protectors. Um, more aspects of the trust protector. It allows for the easy replacement of a trustee. 
I've already talked about how easy it is to change site. Is it's extraordinarily easy to to replace a trustee under the trust protector power. And again, companies, well, at least I can't speak for all trust companies like Bridgeford, we're not afraid of that. It's a it's a checks and balances, so to speak, and it makes sure that Bridgeford Trust is returning its phone calls, and and is being responsive and nimble and and and, and flexible, uh, and serving its trusts and and its beneficiaries well, knowing that literally with a stroke of a pen we can be replaced as can the investment manager. So it also places the, the investment managers on notice that you need to return phone calls and, and work diligently to, to protect trust assets or, or, or that entity can be replaced in the, in the stroke of a pen. That is powerful. And the flexibility that it brings to the overall trust structure, again, I keep coming back to this word, is really revolutionary in our industry. And and I argue very very exciting, uh, and 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 it's something that we love to, love to talk about, because as we know, the circumstances around trust planning change. They change from generation to generation. They they can change because of a divorce, or they can change because of 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 legal circumstances that present themselves. The trust protector, uh, coupled with the directed trust structure, allows for the ability to be nimble to these types of changes that occur in our lifetime. One of the largest complaints, the most prevalent complaints we heard, wasn't even so much about the institutions or, or about asset managers or fees. It was about the overall inflexibility uh, and rigidness, for lack of a better way of saying it, of trust themselves, of irrevocable trusts, and how they couldn't be changed, and how you couldn't get money out of them, and you couldn't select your own asset manager, and 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 you couldn't really adjust and, 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 and react to changes in people's lives, which by the way, happen all the time. So if, you, if you're unable to react and be flexible in the trust world with a, with a vehicle that's supposed to be in place to protect the family of our multiple generations, then why are we even doing this in the first place? Modern trust laws directly address this and the trust protector coupled with the directed trust is the absolute foundation. Um, so why, I think I've gone through why we would want to appoint a trust protector. Um, I think the power of it is very clear. Um, we've written a lot about it on the on our website and done some video work on it. So certainly, you know, for more information, you could certainly go to the website. Um, but it's a powerful tool, and, and again, something that we're very uh, happy to have written in. Now, relative to these fiduciary roles I've talked about, and I'll do a quick review. The fiduciary roles I've talked about are the administrative trustee. That's Bridgeford corporate trustee. We understand that they're a fiduciary. The trust protector is usually, and in most cases, considered a fiduciary. The administrative, excuse me, the distribution committee members or the distribution committee itself is considered a fiduciary. The distribution committee and both distribution and investment committees are both considered fiduciaries. So as you're listening, you might be saying, again, well, why does that matter? It matters because that's a lot of liability. In other words, that's a lot of way, there's a lot of ways that people serving in all three of those roles can be sued. And nobody likes to be sued. And certainly nobody likes that personal liability. South Dakota, being an innovator, uh, obviously, as I said, they were really the, 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 the first to, to invent modern trust laws, in my view, created something that only exists in South Dakota uh, by, by code. It's only, it's only a state that's codified this. and something called a special purpose entity. And it was a direct response to people who said, well, I don't want that liability. I don't want to be a trust protector. I don't need to get sued if I change the trustee or if I make a distribution or choose an investment manager and they blow it. I don't want to get sued over that decision. None of us do. So this, and, and because of that liability, often people refuse to be appointed in those roles, which in my opinion um, negated the whole reason for getting in the modern trust law, to put modern trust laws into these documents. If you can't find people to serve in these capacities, then again, what's the point of having new trust law and modern trust law? So South Dakota's special purpose entity is the answer. And, and again, South Dakota was the only one who came up with the answer, and there's laws, and it places a liability umbrella, for lack of a better way of saying it, over the individual serving in the roles of trust protector, investment committee member, and distribution committee member, protecting them from personal claims. Um, in other words, it's, it's simply an LLC, a South Dakota LLC, that only exists for the sole purpose under South Dakota law to serve as and actually named in the document as a trust protector, investment committee, or distribution committee. So the theory there is that if if 
something happens and somebody is unhappy, particularly a beneficiary, and goes to sue any one of any of those people, any people in any one of those roles, the, the theory is that there should be protection from personal liability if that special purpose entity is, is treated correctly as an LLC. There is no case law. Uh, at this point, uh, to to um, to that these have never been challenged, so that's why there's no case uh, case law. And I need to be be you know full disclosure. We don't have case law on these special purpose entities. We use them, however, very very heavily all over the country. Um, our advisors that we work with love this concept. Um, they come to South Dakota in some cases only because of this concept, uh, because they want to provide the protection uh, to the people serving in these roles. But there's another benefit. And I think equally as important, and particularly as we go through and talk about the importance of choosing the correct trust jurisdiction, when you choose a jurisdiction like South Dakota, you have to make sure it really is a South Dakota trust. And some of you on the phone, on the on the webinar may think that's a funny statement, but you know it isn't just about talking about these sexy new laws. It's about making sure that they apply. And the only way they apply is if these trusts are properly established and administered in the jurisdiction uh, and that's been chosen. And so if in fact these trusts aren't administered correctly, or there's some kind of nexus with a state, home state, which I'll say the state where the, the, the settler lives, then, then we've done all this great work and planning that's going to be easily pierced if, if, if we have the unthinkable and somebody tries to sue the trust and pierce the trust. So the special purpose entity solves the other, the, the nexus problem, and it destroys nexus. And here's the example that we, we use on that, and we've done this multiple times. We work a lot in California because of the high tax uh, rates and because of the fact that there's just a lot of large families who do, would prefer not to have their trusts in, uh, in California for very good reasons. But they would want California residents to serve in the various fiduciary roles that, I, uh, that I've outlined, the trust protector, the investment committee, or distribution committee. So in fact, if we have appointed somebody from California in a fiduciary role, it could be argued that we've, we've destroyed Nexus with South Dakota and it really is a California trust and we don't want that to happen. None of us want that to happen. So we've used these special purpose entities, which again are LLCs created under South Dakota law. It's what's named in the document and it is what is uh, how these individuals uh, make these decisions. It's the, it's the vehicle within which they make the decisions. And the argument is, uh, and the belief is very strongly, that it destroys nexus with any state, and we're using California as an example, and it gives that, that, that dual purpose. It's powerful, it's nuanced, only, it, only to be found in South Dakota, and used in conjunction with the trust protector and the um, uh, directed trust, it's extraordinarily powerful. And again, delivers that direction and control that we're looking for in the industry these days. Here's a quick schematic that, lay, that outlines it. Um, it's outlined in more detail in our again in our in our on our website. There's a video on it that is actually proven to be pretty popular. We've had lots of views on it. Um, if to learn more about it and understand how it works in conjunction with these other concepts, please go there and, and there'll be lots of information. But generally, this outlines how it works. The trust protector investment committee and distribution committee can reside in it. Um, to be clear, they're not operating as a trust company, which is very important, and, and the law in South Dakota delineates that very clearly. Um, there's the opportunity to get insurance at the entity level, which you can't do as an individual trustee, as an individual trust protector or investment committee or distribution committee member. So there's the opportunity, particularly with large families, to get insurance. I mentioned several times it's unique only to South Dakota law and it provides a stronger nexus to South Dakota CITES, which is what we all want to have happen in the planning process. Which transitions us to yet another aspect of South Dakota law that I believe is very exciting because it can only be found in South Dakota. It's brand new, I think it's less than two years old, and it's called a family advisor. And what we like to say it's called, a, we've referred to it as a trust protector light because it has many of the same powers of the trust protector, but it's not a fiduciary. So a couple minutes ago, I was talking about how so many people are concerned about their personal liability, as they should be, um, and, they, and they will not accept an appointment as a trust protector or, or the other two um, uh, fiduciary roles that I've outlined. So South Dakota, again, being innovators, being, being uh, ahead of the game, created a whole separate um, advisory role that's non-fiduciary that allows some of the powers, but not all the powers, but some of the powers of the trust protector um, which are outlined in a minute. Now, this and this is what's beautiful about South Dakota law. They see a problem and they solve it. 
the problem was attorneys and CPAs and, and family members were saying, I don't want to be in that important role. I don't want the fiduciary responsibility. And I like hearing about the special purpose entity. I don't care. I'm still not doing it. I'm out. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And then South Dakota said, okay, what if we created something that didn't give you liability, that didn't give you um, the, the liability that you're worried about? And that's exactly what they did. It's, a, it's an unbelievable distinguishing aspect of South Dakota law that, again, has driven so much activity in the South Dakota other, other, over other what are considered to be top-tier trust jurisdictions, uh, and, it, and it's exciting to implement into the, into the trust document. Um, the three main areas... Uh, that you really can, that we can focus on and bring into the, um, bring into the, 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 the power, I guess, that can be ex exercised is the, the family advisor can remove and appoint a trustee. Um, they can, as you see, they can appoint a successor trust protector or successor family advisor. And they generally can advise on, on family, matter, ma family matters concerning any beneficiary. They can invoke privacy provisions of South Dakota law. And again, for more information about all the, the various uh, aspects of what a family advisor can do, it's on our website. This is powerful. And so again, we're just we're, we're going down the road of building the, uh, the, the, the foundation of what is modern trust law and what is the new wealth management paradigm in this country. And this is just another aspect of it. Decanting is, is something that is important to mention. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, except to say that, in fact, this is another modern trust law that has completely changed the trust industry. So what we've talked about are, are ways to exercise control over a new, newly created trust. We've talked about <laughs> some very compelling ways to deliver uh, direction and control to family members, settlers of trust, and their advisors. And again, it's very exciting and it's revolutionary. But what if you have an old trust? that was created back in the 60s or the 50s or the 80s and that does not have directed trust language and does not have a, a trust protector and is not bifurcating the liability and basically does not give any control and direction to the family that I've been talking about for the last 35 minutes. Well, this is where, where decanting has changed the game again because this is a, a new modern trust law Ironically, first out of New York, which is New York State, which is not known for its modern uh, thinking. And uh, no offense to my friends in New York City, but I think you agree. Um, decanting is much like what you think of when you pour a, a a bottle of wine into a decanter. It takes an old, tired trust, uh, distributes the assets into a new trust with presumably more powerful, uh, more modern. I would say powerful, but also more modern trust laws. And you can do it without court, inf court intervention. So what we're talking about is taking these great modern trust laws, this whole new paradigm of wealth uh, management with respect to trust administration, and infusing these aspects into a new trust. I really like to say breathing new life into these old, tired trusts that just don't work anymore. And as we talked about how the dynamic nature of family relationships and what happens over generation to generation, we need a mechanism to change these old trusts. So it would be great to have these modern trust laws, but if you can't incorpor incorporate them into a, an old trust, what's again, what's the purpose of ha having them? States that have decanting statutes, we're, we're, we're forward thinking, and we're very excited to use this, these laws. Um, you'll see towards the end of the, of the conversation that decanting statutes are not all created equally. Um, it's important to know that. Uh, and we'll talk about why, but really when we use decanting is to, is to move situs, to draft and correct drafting errors. Um, what's so exciting about this in many respects is you don't always have to give notice to beneficiaries and, and the decanting statutes, um, particularly in South Dakota, which has been routinely recognized as the most flexible, uh, are powerful and just another aspect of modern trust law. What's very interesting to talk about, and it's something that we won't get into a lot today, but I would love to take questions on or talk to you offline, is, is there a duty to decant? In the United States, there's been a lot of question around, not only is there a duty to decant, but is it in fact malpractice? If a practitioner does not look at a progressive trust jurisdiction, or more particularly and more broadly, consider modern trust law as we've described it so far. Is it somehow malpractice to not tell a family member about the fact that if you put a trust in South Dakota and make it a dynasty trust, that that trust would never have to pay uh, state taxation because it's not forced to end. Now, there's been a lot 
written on this. Harvard Law Review has written an article about this over the years. I'm writing a piece on it myself, and this is something I'm particularly interested in. But this is one of the first court cases that came down last year from Massachusetts Supreme Court. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details, but it raised the question and was answered in the affirmative that there was, in fact, a duty to decant if the trustee deemed decanting to be in the beneficiary's best interest. It involved a divorce. It involved knowing that there was a claim coming. It involved uh, the idea that decanting was available. And it raised the question for the trustee, again, which was answered in the affirmative, that, in fact, there was a duty to take affirmative action to decant this particular trust to make it less susceptible to an attack from a divorcing spouse. That is a very compelling shot across the bow in terms of development in, in, in case law in malpractice. And what I mean by that is, that is one of the first times in the United States that there, the court has considered the idea of a duty to deal with modern trust laws. Again, decanting is a, is a modern trust law. It's something to look at. It's something to watch. I believe that in the relative short term, we're going to see cases that actually consider this to be malpractice. The focus was on the trustee, whether the trustee had the duty, because legally the trustee is the one that would be the petitioner. We can get into the details offline on that. But the point is, why would that not apply to lawyers? Why would that not apply to accountants? It's something to think about. It's something to be aware of. And, and while some seemingly controversial to think about and worry about, it is a reality. Modern trust laws exist. They are here. They're only going to get more progressive. And if a practitioner or a trust company or an attorney isn't advising on these, I absolutely believe that there could be an instance of malpractice that they're going to have to defend and explain. An important issue with respect to the development of modern trust law that also, I believe, delivers far more control and direction is the ability for families to engage and implement privacy. Now, we're not talking about secrecy. We're talking about privacy. Secrecy is different. Secrecy is, is when you think of Switzerland and when you think of people to trying to hide bank accounts for tax evasion. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about fundamental rights to privacy. And you might be surprised to know, uh, a lot of you on this, on this webinar, that in fact, in most states, the fundamental right to privacy really doesn't exist. And there are two aspects of that, relative to a, the existence of a quiet trust and relative to the idea of a total court seal if the trust ends up in litigation. And we're going to talk briefly about the two of those. In most states, there is no ability to carve in a quiet trust provision, which means that when a child turns the age of 18 or 21, depending on the state, there is a duty imposed on the trust company to inform the beneficiary and not only inform the beneficiary, but give them statements. Well, when you're 21 years old and a junior or senior at Harvard and you start to receive a statement from Morgan Stanley saying that you're the beneficiary of a $100 million trust, what do you think the motivation is to go back to school the following fall? Probably not much. So families want to be able to control this information. Not that they're hiding it from their children. They want to be able to control the information. And they frankly resent any state telling them that they have to tell anybody of the existence of the trust, even their own children. And I tend to agree with that. And so the idea of acquired trust is, is very, very important, particularly to wealthy families who want to control the information. And again, is another aspect of modern trust law that delivers that kind of control because they didn't have it before, and they certainly don't have it in, in, in trust, it's, uh, trust uh, jurisdictions that don't, that don't offer a quiet trust provision. The idea of a court seal is something also that doesn't exist in most states. It's only a handful of states, and it's only South Dakota where it's a total seal forever. What that means is, is should they, as I mentioned earlier, should the trust end up in litigation, which happens probably more times than any of us would like, that information becomes a matter of public record. And when you say, what information, Dave? What, what, what's that information you're referring to? I'm talking about the names of beneficiaries. I'm talking about who's managing the money. I'm talking about who the settlers are. I'm talking about all aspects of the trust can become public by virtue of it being placed on a public docket. I know this because I used to practice law and I used to see it all the time in Pennsylvania. There's no provision to seal that information once it hits a public docket. That is a problem. It's, not a, it's a problem for all creators of trust and beneficiaries of trust. We collectively don't want that information in the public domain. It doesn't belong in the public domain. And it strikes, in my opinion, at the very heart of, of a fundamental notion of, of, of privacy. 
Again, surprisingly, most states don't have that provision. South Dakota has both provisions. South Dakota has a very, very powerful quiet trust provision, which, as I mentioned, seals that information, or I should, seals the wrong word, protects that information from getting disseminated to beneficiaries and allows the settlers of the trust to make that decision. And it's carved out right in the document, and it gives the power, frankly, to the trust protector to make the decision in terms of who's going to know what about that trust. And again, not only is that powerful for, for, for domestic families, but that's one of the biggest reasons why families from Latin America, which I heard about firsthand last week in Mexico City uh, through several presentations, why they're coming to the United States. for They're chasing this kind of privacy that they can't get in the international community. So again, these states are not created equally. South Dakota, as I mentioned, has a total seal forever and it's not discretionary. Most states, it's open to the public. Most states do not have a quiet trust provision. Delaware, to juxtapose that state, because there seems to be a presumption that Delaware is, is, is the best trust jurisdiction, which I think is increasingly not the case. Um, but this is another aspect of why it's not true. They seal it for three years, and then it becomes open to the public, and it's discretionary. In South Dakota, it's not discretionary. It has to happen as an operation of law. In a state like Delaware, you have to get a judge to agree to it, and that's a problem because often judges don't see the need for um, for secrecy or privacy privacy so we're going to go to the really wind up the discussion I think it's clear that I'm very passionate about these about these modern trust laws um, but really the only way you get them is choosing the correct jurisdiction and this is another quote that, that has really been a guiding light uh, or principle rather of Bridgeford which is to say the choice of a state in which to create a trust is as critical as, this, as the decision to create one. So think about that for a second. The choice of a state in which to establish a trust is as important as to even why to create the trust in the first place. Why is that so true now more than ever? Because of the modern trust laws I just talked about. Every single modern trust law that I talked about that has so drastically revolutionized the trust industry is not available in every state. And in fact, has really been only available in a handful of states. Uh, in combination. And here they are, top U.S. trust states as, as identified by Trust in the States magazine year over year. They, they do a, a copious survey, survey, a very detailed survey, and year over year for at least the last 10 or 12 years, um, this race to establish the most pro trust, progressive trust jurisdiction um, has been followed by not only Trust in the States magazine, but the law review articles and, and practitioners and, and white papers. And these are the top tier trust jurisdictions that I think everybody would agree on. South Dakota, Delaware, Nevada, and Alaska. They have the most powerful modern trust laws. And, and there are others that we haven't discussed today on this, on this webinar. We will in future webinars. But universally, these are the jurisdictions that are considered to be the strongest. And, and something that I think for all practitioners, particularly our friends around the world who are listening, these are the jurisdictions to, to consider. Now, to be clear, just because all four of these trust jurisdictions are considered top tier doesn't mean the four of them are created equally, which is something that we've become particularly passionate about, um, not because we want to be self-serving and sell South Dakota, but because we want to give the best advice and the best objective uh, opinion as to where we can go. You know, Bridgeford Trust Company is young enough to say with convic conviction uh, that we are in South Dakota for a reason. We, we chose it for very specific reasons, and, and here's a chart that was established over many years with the help of, a, of, of an amazing team at Bridgeford uh, that cites what we're saying. And we're going to go quickly down. You can see the citation. This is available on our website. And again, this is objective, and it's, 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 it's relying on the opinions of people far smarter than myself and far smarter than the, the people at Bridgeford Trust. And here it is, the, 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 the Dynasty Trust is what we've talked about, what we led with. I said, I believe it's the beginning of modern trust law. For several years in a row, Steve Oceans, who's a Nevada attorney, an excellent Nevada attorney, has consistently now, now, and I say as of today, today his new chart was released, has put South Dakota as being the number one trust jurisdiction, dynasty trust jurisdiction in the country. So we have to update our citation there because it's a sixth annual, now the seventh annual as of today. It's very exciting. We're very proud of it, and there's some very good reasons for it. You can consult his chart. That will give you his reason. Um, stay in income tax. We didn't talk about it today, um, but it, it analyzes the idea of whether or not there's state income tax. And none of the top tier trust jurisdictions have a state income tax. It's important, and it's a topic of another another webinar we will do. Community property trust did not talk about it today, but a very very powerful planning tool that essentially allows 
spouses to avoid or rather to implement a step up on basis over jointly held property that doesn't exist in their home jurisdiction. Again, another topic for another day. Very compelling planning tool and, and very red hot right now. Domestic asset protection, which has been talked about. Again, this chart does a comparison, talks about how South Dakota is, is compares with other jurisdictions. Um, all the top tier just, just, trust jurisdictions has a trust protector statute, which is important. They all have a directed trust statute. So again, we're getting the, the point of, of this chart is to say you can only avail yourselves of these modern, powerful, paradigm changing trust laws by going to the correct trust jurisdiction. And I'm, I'm suggesting that these four or five here are, are the top and there are reasons to suggest that perhaps South Dakota may just be a little bit better than the other four listed. The decanting statute I mentioned earlier has been consistently ranked as the best out of South Dakota. Again, that's Steve Oceans, the Nevada attorney I referenced before. Very excited about that and it's because of its flexibility and again is a big reason why we're seeing more and more activity coming to South Dakota. The trust privacy provisions, which we've talked about, um, which clearly I'm very excited about, is uh, South Dakota has hands down been considered the, the best trust jurisdiction for privacy. It's acknowledged around the world as the best trust jurisdiction for privacy. And the quote directly from Trust in the Six magazine says, for those of you who can't see it, of the top tier trust jurisdiction, South Dakota has the best trust privacy laws. So again, that in combination with being ranked the best decanting statute and, and having the best decanting statute rather and the best um, dynasty trust state, having a special purpose entity and a family advisor which do not exist in the other top tier trust jurisdictions, uh, in, in our view and the view of many practitioners tend to indicate that South Dakota may be uh, one of the best options there for trust planning. Really the point though is not to sell South Dakota, as I said, it's to be an objective discussion and to have an objective discussion about how and where and when to choose a particular trust jurisdiction because these decisions matter. And as the quote said earlier, it is probably more important, this decision as to where to put this trust uh, relative to even to have the, the trust at all. You know, the trust industry is undergoing a quiet revolution that has wrested control of trust accounts away from traditional trustees, primarily in the banks and other large institutions that I've been referencing throughout the webinar, and putting it back into the hands of independent trust companies and advisors. Back into the hands of independent trust companies and their advisors, which I argue is where it belongs, and that is the essence of these modern trust laws. There's a theme to all of them, and it's putting direction and control back where it belongs with the settlers of trust, with the beneficiaries of trusts and the advisors that serve the families. For information, please, you know, just certainly check out Bradford's website, which is brand new. We're very excited about it. Um, all the concepts I talked about are well represented, written on. We have informational pieces on all of them, which you can certainly download. We have videos on all of those as well, which have been pretty popular. They're short, succinct videos. Um, we're proud of that. Please feel free to, to learn more. It's hard to go through all of these concepts in, in, in a mere 55 minutes. Um, you know, we're, we're very excited about Bridgeford's sponsoring of Heckerling. I know a lot of you on the call or on the webinar will be there. I look forward to seeing you in, in, in Orlando in January. This is the first time we're actually a full-blown sponsor uh, with a booth, so we're very excited about that and, and all that Heckerling has to offer for us. Um, and then and finally, Look at um, our website. We are a sponsor of a, a very successful event called Collaborate. Um, I'll be one of the speakers. It's uh, it's a it's an annual event now that's on its fourth year, I believe, that has come to be actually six year, that has come to be extraordinarily uh, successful, bringing in top advisors, uh, business owners, uh, and speakers really from around the country. Not to suggest I'm one of those, but we do have um, the former governor. Um, Tom Ridge, uh, who is going to be speaking, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, was the first uh, head of Homeland Security. We're very excited that he's going to be the keynote speaker this year. I'm proud to be part of the event. Bridgeford's proud to be a sponsor, and this is, and we've been doing it since in, since its, its inception. Sorry, it's the very end of the webinar, and uh, we certainly encourage you to look at that. There's certainly time to to sign up. So thank you to everybody who uh, who signed up. It was great to see. Uh, friends old and new from around the country and across the world, please feel free to contact me directly with any questions offline. There certainly is going to be an opportunity to ask questions online, and uh, I look forward to that in the next section. So thank you all, and look forward to seeing you soon.
Oh, sorry for the delay there, folks. We had some technical uh, difficulties there. Um, we are excited, again, to take some take some questions. Uh, we've gotten multiple questions, which are great. And in interest of time, we are going to uh, only address a few of those. Uh, but again, I want to thank everybody for participating today. We have friends from all over the country and around the world. And it's great to be uh, to see so many familiar faces and new faces uh, and names on, on the webinar. Um, a really good question that came in, which is um, really directed to how the big bank trust industry has reacted to this, uh, or reacted to these modern trust laws. And I think it's a great question because it's really fascinating to watch um, big banks respond. And I think Morgan Stanley has actually been, been, been a really interesting example because they've embraced this idea of bifurcating uh, the the sales and uh, or not rather the sales but the uh, administration and the investment functions in the trust world and and years ago decided to to sell their trust company and created a um, a open architecture trust solution um, which was one of their trust partners but, but the the point is um, they've seen these changes in the trust industry um, UBS is another one um, other large bank based uh, trust companies are realizing the conflict. Uh, and the lack of control and are giving their uh, clients and prospects the ability to have uh, the control over who's going to be the administrative trustee uh, and, and, and in fact even who can manage the money in some cases. So um, it's interesting as we talked about how revolutionary these modern trust laws, um, big banks are responding and I think in a, in a very positive way which is only good for the, for the consumer and the advisors and the beneficiaries of trust as, as we go forward. Um, another really good question uh, that came in, uh, which is uh, really a specific question, but I think one certainly worth addressing is um, something that somebody saw on the chart. So the question is the chart re references the community property trusts, and it asked if we could talk a little bit about it and, and how it works in conjunction with the other modern trust laws. Um, the community pro property trust is, is actually a very powerful tool, a very compelling tax play. Uh, that only exists in three states, uh, Alaska, um, Tennessee, uh, but I think for Tennessee it's only available for its residents, and South Dakota. And it's relatively new, I think less than two years old for South Dakota, uh, considered by most commentaries to be the most flexible, especially in conjunction with the, uh, the modern trust laws that we've talked about in the last hour. And, and the idea with the community property trust is really for married couples uh, to take advantage of 100% step up in basis. Uh, at the at the uh, in the event of the second to die, um, so it really is a tremendous state tax play, um, and worked in, in conjunction with the dynasty trusts that we've already talked about, uh, asset protection trusts, which we did not get into much, but we can certainly incorporate into a, a community property trust, uh, all within the, the the foundation of a of a um, all within the foundation of a directed trust, uh, really provides. Uh, a, a tremendous amount of planning opportunities while maintaining the, the control and direction uh, that can be enjoyed by uh, settlers of trust, beneficiaries, and, and their advisors. Um, you know, the final question that I'd like to, like to address uh, is, is uh, another really good question that says, uh, can these provisions be incorporated into foreign grantor trusts? And if so, can non-U.S. citizens serve as a trust protector or on the investment or distribution committee? Um, the reason why this is such a timely question is because of, as most of you on this webinar realize, uh, there is a tremendous amount of activity in, in large families uh, coming to the United States uh, to uh, avail themselves of, of really the power of U.S. trust law um, or because they have a, a connection to, to the United States. And the answer to that question is absolutely. Uh, we can establish a foreign grantor trust, which is simply defined as a trust that is established by a non-U.S. resident. Um, all of the aspects of, of control and direction that we've been talking about for the last hour can be incorporated. And absolutely, uh, non-U.S. citizens can serve as a trust protector the investment in, on the investment committee or on the distribution committee. And in, and in some cases, depending on uh, some of the planning nuances, it's actually recommended. And that's in the context of a, of a, of a um, hybrid uh, foreign grantor trust, which is really a pretty compelling tax move for international families. Um, so in the interest of time, we have many other questions, but we're going to cut it off there. I thank you all for sending the questions. I, again, thank you all for joining. Um, I hope that you found um, the webinar useful. Uh, as I'm sure is evident, we are very excited and passionate about what we can do with these modern trust laws and how revolutionary uh, they have been over the last 15 or 20 years in our space. 
Um, so again, thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks again for joining us for today's webinar. A special thanks to David for lending his time and expertise today. A recap of today's presentation will be posted on Bridgeford Trust Company's website at www.bridgefordtrust.com. Look for that to be up in the next few days. Have a great rest of your day.